Welcome to New Money. I'm Tracy Chang. 3D printing. Many people say it's got the potential to revolutionize the entire manufacturing industry. But in reality, what stands in the way to popularize the technology? We begin this episode with two biggest misconceptions. In the movie thriller Chinese Zodiac, action star Jackie Chan is on the mission to return 12 stolen national treasures to China. With the help of 3D printing technology, Chen reproduces the pilfered bronze animal heads to cleverly trick his enemies. In real life, a Shandong company was making an even bolder move, using 3D technology to print an actual house. With no concrete and no steel, the company planned to take six months to complete this architectural project. For smaller projects, we can now see real-life dolls, crafts, a bicycle, or even biological cells emerging from tiny print heads. However, the prints carry two common misconceptions. They think 3D printing is omniscient. In the future, we won't have to go to stores anymore. If we want utensils, bread, chocolates, or milk, we just need to print them out. This is, in fact, a misunderstanding. A lot of times, things that are 3D printed are only being 3D printed because it's cool to 3D print them. Um, I think what's needed is not only improvements in the materials to drive down cost, um, but we also need applications and designs and really content um, such that um, what's being 3D printed can't be produced any other way. According to an online definition, 3D printing is the manufacturing process of making three-dimensional objects. It's called an additive process in which powders are fused together layer by layer based on the 3D model or the electronic data. The computer-controlled process was developed by American inventor Chuck Howell in the 1980s. Howell was the first to commercialize the technology with his company Stratasys in the 1990s. Any material, solid or liquid, theoretically can be fused into any shape, just like a sculpture. But the process is time-consuming and expensive, depending on the size, material and complexity of the model. Traditional manufacturing has been very mature after thousands of years of practice. Its economy of scale is clearly not the strength of 3D printing. We need to understand what 3D printing is for. It's mainly used in rapid modeling, which is a process in companies' research and development. It's not a manufacturing tool, it's a supporting tool, which supports individualized small-scale designs or large-scale but custom-made productions. But what about human body parts? If a person's heart fails, can we 3D print a new one? To print an item that has the shape of a human heart, no problem. But to print something that has the functions of a heart, we will still need to work on that. Dr. Peng and his colleagues at the Chinese People's Liberation Army General Hospital have been among the first in China to test 3D printing technology in the treatment of patients with bone problems. You see, a bird's nest looks simple and messy, but the way every twig is laid is based on mechanics. That's why the nest does get broken in storms. A man-made nest would fall to pieces as soon as the winds come. Mm. True 3D printing isn't just about the shape, but the inner structure, especially in terms of human organs. You need to make sure every cell in every different part has its functions. Peng says 3D printing technology is most often used now in producing simulation models of human body parts and special surgery tools. The technology is also used to create supporting structures, such as man-made joints that are implanted into human bodies. But those structures aren't alive, and in fact, there hasn't yet been a single case anywhere in the world where living human body parts are 3D printed and then transplanted. 
Medical professionals think it will be at least another 15 to 30 years before we can see that happen. 3D printing has been around for nearly three decades. The sewing industry experts estimate its worldwide market just accounted for under $4 billion as of 2014. That was less than what a global internet company such as Google made in a year. Luo Jun is the leader of a Chinese 3D printing trade group, and he says that in China, the money isn't in the printing, it's in the printers. Luo says that most of China's 3D printing businesses are profiting from making and selling 3D printers that can range from several hundred dollars for consumer-oriented desktop machine to tens of millions of dollars for ones used in industry. 3D printing is globally recognized as an advanced manufacturing technology. Why hasn't it grown big? I think the reason is that it lacks a mature business model, a model that you can quickly turn the technology into products and market. To talk more about how 3D printing can be more effectively introduced to the market from a business point of view, we're joined by Professor Jia Ning, Deputy Director at Tsinghua University's China Business Case Center. Welcome, Professor Jia, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. So 3D printing, is this technology a revolutionizing invention or mostly hype? Is it going to change the world? You know, this is a great question, Tracy. I think this debate has been going on for quite some time. In fact, back in 2012, I think the uh, Economist magazine actually published an in-depth special report on 3D printing and called it the, uh, the third industrial revolution, you know, together with uh, digital manufacturing. But I think at this point, it's probably still a little too early to tell whether uh, 3D printing is capable of launching the third industrial revolution, right? But assuming that 3D technology and uh, the entire value chain do move forward the way we expected, I think this technology will have a significant and profound impact on our economy in several ways. So one is it may actually subvert this traditional notion of economy of scale. Right? So if you look at uh, manufacturing models in today's world, there are essentially two types. One is mass production, right? the other one is customization. With 3D printing, I think it's actually able to combine the best of these two production models. Right? So it's possible that in the future, you know, the factories can just focus on mass customization as opposed to mass production, right? And it's also possible that now, because centralizing production and also economy of scale will no longer offer competitive advantage, so maybe in the future we'll no longer see uh, manufacturing conglomerates, right? So instead, the production will be done using a web of smaller manufacturers, right, who are flexible, who are able to adapt to the changing environment uh, quickly. So, Professor, the sector right now is valued at a low billions range, but right. this technology has been around for a decade now. What's the problem in terms of having difficulty gaining traction? Right, uh, that's a good question, Tracy. Well, you're right. I think this sector is currently valued in the low billion dollar range. But you know, let's not forget the fact that this sector has been enjoying a double digit growth. I think the average was about 20 to 25 percent, you know, over the last several years. And it was one of the seven uh, fastest growing sectors in the United States. Right. And if you look at sort of the average P ratio uh, of the two leading 3D printing companies in the U.S., 3D Systems and Stratasys, their P, you know, price earnings ratio, were well above 50, right? which means the market and the investors are still quite optimistic about the future growth prospect of these two companies. Um, you know, what's the problem in gaining market traction? I think that was another question you asked. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of reasons, I think. Uh, one reason I can think of is the technology itself, you know, its quality, its stability, and uh, in particular, its cost effectiveness. I think it's a common belief that 3D printing costs, you know, the overall cost is still very high, mm -hmm. especially the cost of input materials. Um, it's estimated that the, uh, the plastic, you know, used for 3D printing costs about 10 times more than the tr sort of regular plastic for traditional manufacturing. And, um, and another challenge I can see here is uh, the, uh, the value chain. So the entire 3D printing value chain is still largely underdeveloped, and there's little synergy between upstream and downstream divisions, right? So when you go buy a home printer, you know, you buy the printer, you also need the cartridge, right? Mm -hmm. It's a package deal. You can't really get one without the other one. Um, but now, you know, the uh, supply 
uh, of input materials for 3D printing is very limited. It's mostly like metal, ceramics, uh, what else, plastics, right? And uh, there's only a dozen companies who are doing research and development on input materials, right? Mm. So if the uh, input materials doesn't develop fast enough, it's gonna adversely affect the sales of the 3D printers. So, Professor, from what I understand, actually most of these 3D printing companies concentrate on selling 3D printers instead of providing printing services. Is that a viable strategy? Right. Um, so, Tracy, if you look at the entire value chain for a 3D sector, it can mm -hmm. be largely divided into three components. So, the upstream uh, component is actually the R&D manufacturing of input materials for mm -hmm. 3D printers. And the component in the middle is actually uh, the manufacturing of the equipment itself, which is a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. And the downstream division is actually providing services. So you can either uh, print the end product directly for your customers, or you can assist your customers in uh, their prototyping, for example, right? And this service has a wide spectrum of applications, ranging from like aerospace to mm -hmm. uh, filming industries to medicals and et cetera, right? So you can, um, as, a, as a player in this market, you can make money in either one of those three components, or you can try to capture the entire value chain. Now, in the U.S., you know there are two companies uh, who try to capture the entire value chain, and mm -hmm. one of them is 3D Systems, mm -hmm. and the other one is uh, Stratasys. Right, and so let's look at um, 3D Systems revenue breakdown by um, its product and service offerings. Right, mm -hmm. so as you can see, um, the revenues from the sales of 3D printers mm -hmm. still constitute a majority of its, uh, its revenues, whereas uh, the revenues coming from the other two components has been decreasing actually right. over the years, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the situation in the U.S. And if you look at you know, 3D uh, systems gross margin, its gross margin is approximately 40 to 50 percent, and its net margin is about uh, in the 10 percent bracket, oh, right? Wow. So they're still making uh, some decent profit. So I think as long as uh, the sales of 3D printer is still a profitable business mm -hmm. it's okay to just focus on that but you know we can also imagine that going forward you know as the technology moves uh, forward and as more players come into this market it's going to drive down uh, the price of 3d printers right so when that happens you know these uh, players will definitely have to look for other uh, components right to make more uh, money right potentially Absolutely. in the sales of input materials or providing more services 3D printers' hefty price tag and limited applications in China seem to be hurtling the growth of the business. When we come back, we'll explore the strategies to help the growth of this technology in China. Stay tuned.